get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, now Dr. Lauren Cordain, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm excited. We have Dr. Lauren Cordain, who's acknowledged as the world's leading expert on the Paleolithic diet. He has been a professor at Colorado State University for over 30 years and is one of the top global researchers in the area of evolutionary medicine focused on diet and health with hundreds of peer-reviewed scientific publications. Dr. Cordain is the author of many best-selling books, including The Paleo Diet, The Paleo Answer, The Paleo Diet Cookbook. I have sitting beside me, you can't see, The Paleo Diet and The Paleo Diet for Athletes. Dr. Cordain, thanks for joining me. Hey, that was a very nice uh, introduction. So it's all true, right? So, um, you know, I wanted to start off, and we were talking like before about um, you know some of the stuff you're doing with autoimmunity, leaky gut, acne. What's the latest research you're working on right now that you're most excited about? Well, I'm retired right now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I've been retired since 2013, so. Um, I'm kind of dabbling in it. I, mm-hmm. we don't, I no longer have my lab, and my graduate students have all come and gone. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I work on it um, by simply reading the, the scientific literature. Mm-hmm. And the last thing that, and the last graduate student that I had, uh, we were interested in, in the etiology of autoimmune disease. Yeah. And it's a it's a real black box disease. There's over a hundred autoimmune diseases, and uh, there's clearly a genetic component and an environmental component to it. Yeah, and the genetic component is uh, is fairly well known, and it has to do with part of our immune system called the human leukocyte antigen or HLA system, mm-hmm. and um, it just predisposes people to certain autoimmune diseases. And right. most people that have that HLA um, predisposition never get autoimmune disease. Really? Yeah. Wow. So most people that uh, have that predisposition don't ever uh, get an autoimmune disease. So that's really the, the tricky question is, is uh, what environmental factors interact with that genetic predisposition to cause autoimmunity? And so it's a, it's a, it's kind of like a moving target. It's a, it's a tricky wicket. Is that the way we think about disease, typically, uh, particularly infectious disease, is we think about it as this agent causes that disease or that those symptoms. But with autoimmune disease. It seems like um, multiple agents interacting together with multiple parts of the immune system can create symptoms that are very difficult to distinguish from one another. And that's our kind of our working hypothesis is that uh, uh, multiple sclerosis may not be one single disease caused by one single factor. I see, yeah. It might be multiple uh, environmental effects caused by multiple uh, environmental triggers, but given that, we we still seem to think that it's it's working through common pathways. Mm-hmm. What have you found? What autoimmune diseases do you find are help most or quickest with the paleo diet? Um, I, I'm not a, a practicing clinician. I'm a yeah guy that uh, sits in the background the and research around on the chessboard <laughs> right so what we're doing is we're we're playing with kind of theoretical ideas mm-hmm. and uh, at least in my experience the uh, uh, factors or the the disease that is is probably uh, best treated by autoimmune diseases are GI tract diseases, which we're not even sure if they are autoimmune in nature. Mm-hmm. Like Crohn's, irritable bowel, that type of thing? 
Yeah, Crohn's, irritable bowel, and ulcerative colitis mm -hmm. seem to respond fairly well to this uh, problem. Um, multiple sclerosis, if you can catch it early on, uh, within you know the first couple of months or a, a year or two of, of diagnosis, seems to respond, um, but not in all cases. And yeah. same same thing with rheumatoid arthritis. It's uh, it seems to uh, be effective. We, we, my last graduate student, Trevor Connor, we completed a uh, a large epidemiologic study mm -hmm. with over a hundred autoimmune patients that had been on the paleo diet. Yeah, and uh, one of the diseases that that seemed to respond was Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Oh, really? And, yeah, and. Uh, so, but it, that may be a statistical anomaly because that far and away is the the, uh, the most of, of any autoimmune disease is, is that particular disease. So, um, so th those are some of the things that we're working on, and uh, uh, you know, it's gonna. It'll be years before these ideas are tested. Yeah. The diet acne hypothesis. Uh, we actually worked that out in uh, oh about the year 2000, and we got our first paper out in 2002, yeah. which was an epidemiologic paper. And uh, here we are in 2016. Mm -hmm. We're making pretty good progress on it now. There's a couple of I don't know, a half dozen randomized control trials that support the hypothesis. So uh, science moves slowly, but in the, the bigger picture is that uh, uh, celiac disease, did, we didn't even know what caused it until 1950. So that's only been 65 years. Right. Yeah, I mean, you've been doing this for, for over 30 years, um, this particular research, and discovered even before then. Um, so it, it's taken a time to hit its tipping point. When, when did the paleo diet in the book really, you felt really explode and catch on? About nine, uh, 2009. Mm -hmm. What do you think caused the tipping point? The internet. The internet. <laughs> yeah, the internet. So uh, when you think about it, uh, in the, I, I finished writing the book in 2002. Right. Yeah, I have the updated version, and you do talk a little about this in the beginning. Right, and yeah. so in 2002, the the uh, the internet was just brand new. Google yeah. was in, only came out in 1998, and in, in those days, very few people had home computers, let alone uh, you know all of the social media and smartphones and everything that goes with it. So that, that stuff basically didn't exist for the yeah. United States population. And then, oh, you know, that started to become more and more common in the, the mid-2000s, 2004 and five and six. Right. And then uh, uh, things really exploded in 2009. And uh, part of it was the CrossFit people got a hold of it. And yeah. And so I think that's one of the reasons it, is that when people come up with a good idea that works, um, they tend to tell their neighbors and friends about it. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I think that uh, anecdotal evidence, although it's not scientific evidence, mm -hmm. uh, is, is a powerful evidence in that it it gets people thinking about things. And, and so uh, it, it tends to work. It tends to, um, and you're, we're going to talk to Lane Sebring, a, a physician from Texas, yeah. is that it, it tends to work. Uh, it tends to lower blood pressure, normalize uh, blood lipids. Yeah. Um, and anecdotally, it tends to, uh, to seem to cure or help diseases that, have really known whom caused, and so that's been my experience with it. Is that it does those things, but 
um, anecdotal evidence yeah. and a dollar will buy you a cup of coffee in science. So <laughs> we have to we have to go further. And the first trials of the paleo diet, a randomized controlled trial, uh, where you actually take two groups of people, an experimental and a control group, and one gets the treatment and one it becomes the control group. The first randomized controlled trials of a paleo diet only hap- happened in 2007. Wow. So it's been a very, very short period. And since then, we have now had roughly 19 trials. And just recently, last year, we had our first what's called a meta-analysis. Okay. And what a meta-analysis is, is it <clears throat> combines um, multiple trials, and there's special statistics that are used in meta-analysis uh, so that you can analyze multiple experiments with multiple sample sizes and, and a variety of other uh, factors so that you can make sense out of one trial. So yeah. in the olden days, people said, oh, pizza is bad for you because it does this. Oh, pizza is good for you because it does that. For every trial looking at pizza or some other junk food, right. it could be said that uh, uh, you know it works one way or the other. But with meta-analyses, uh, it, it provides another stronger way of looking at things. Mm-hmm. So the first meta-analysis of a, a paleo diet was done just in 2015, mm. so we're pretty recent. It. Very recent. It yeah. was done in. It was published in October, I think, and uh, uh, it, it, it tended to show that uh, this was a more effective way looking. And it, you look at the endpoints. You look at blood pressure. You look at cholesterol. You look at weight loss. You look at uh, you know gut circumference and, and a variety of endpoints. You can look at other blood parameters involving the immune system, involving in, inflammation like CRP and, and mm-hmm. what have you, but uh, it, it, it tended to show that uh, this was a very effective way to uh, get weight off, keep weight off, and, and protect uh, the body from risk factors that are associated with chronic disease. Yeah. I mean, you know, Dr. Sebring bases his entire practice around the paleo diet, essentially. Hey, that's pretty flattering, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. Um, cause he knows and has seen it work in, obviously you've, you've done the research to back it, but he's seen it work clinically over and over again. You know, you know, I, I've, I've heard that from, from many multiple practitioners and, and those guys are really in the trenches doing um, the work. So, uh, uh, I, I, you know, I respect uh, Dr. Sebring. He's a, a very uh, knowledgeable uh, practitioner. Yeah. And uh, uh, his work corroborates some of the theoretical stuff right. we've written about. Yeah. I mean, what's interesting, Dr. Cordain, is that, you know, most diets are fads. This is kind of stood the test of time and you even talk about that and I recommend anyone get the paleo diet book there's a lot of explanations information there and also there's science backing this um and when I read and look online to give people like a sense of when you first put out the book th- compared to now when you search on paleo books there's like thousands of them what was the landscape like when you first came out with the book well, before I talk about that, I think yeah. you bring up a good point, is that um, the landscape before I wrote the paleo diet yeah. uh, was scientists talking to one another on what are now called blogs. We called them listserv, right. listserv uh, serves back in the day, you yeah. know, 19, golly, in the... 90s maybe 92 or mm-hmm. 90 yeah, when pre Google even well yeah when people yeah. were getting involved with the internet and talking to one another yeah um, there was very few of us and yeah the people that were talking to one another were scientists basically yeah. or or very interested lay people and that's how uh, part of the, the concept got going was uh, people talking to one another on these listservs. But even before then, uh, I really attribute the interest in this uh, to my mentor, Boyd Eaton, who 
is at Emory, or was it? He still is at Emory University as an adjunct faculty, right. and uh, I, I believe he's retired now. But uh, uh, he he really started everything in 1985, uh, the modern era of the paleo diet. There's now there's papers that go back earlier than that, but his paper. Uh, came out in 1985 in the New England Journal of Medicine, and that's really what got me going. Mm. Is I read that paper two years later in 1987, mm. and I thought, "Wow, this is just about the best idea I've ever heard really? regarding uh, optimal human nutrition." Yeah. And all the all the players in the field, Stefan Lindeberg, Pedro Bastos, and others um, that have published in the area, we can all go back and cite that single paper we all read mm -hmm. it the paleolithic nutrition paper yes yeah so everybody's read that paper and that really it was boy boyd's idea that uh that got me going and uh so if you have to look to anybody i think you, you look to boyd is the guy that started mm -hmm. the modern era of paleo diet and uh before my book there was a handful of books, you know, you, you could, if you went online and you went to, in even those days, I don't even know if Amazon existed, but. <laughs> right, it probably, it didn't. Uh, yeah. It didn't. And so if you went online, you could find, you know, one or two, maybe three books. Boyd wrote one in 88, and there's a couple of pioneers that go even before then. Mm -hmm. But uh, it just, it was a, it, it was just a, an idea that scientists handed around and we got online and some of the the conversations that uh, took place on those listservs uh, were the very same conversations that we're having today. So, uh, yeah. Well, how did you discover his work? Just through one of the listservs? Um, no, I, <clears throat> you know, I'm a professor at Colorado State University. Yeah. And of all things, we have a, a student newspaper. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I was and, not expecting that answer. But. <laughs> and so uh, there was a girl that had written a, a short, brief little paper mm -hmm. about Boyd Eaton's paper yeah. that appeared in the New England Journal in 85, and I think she wrote about it in 86 or 87. Mm -hmm. So In I, the I, school newspaper? In the school newspaper. Wow. And thank I, God for that girl. Her, what? Thank God for that girl. Yeah, so she was just a student reporter, and she had somehow picked up on it and wrote a little paper about it. Hmm. And so I went down to the library, because in those days you couldn't, you know, there was no such thing as PDF files. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I went down There's to the library Dewey and, looked system. Up, and right. I Xeroxed it and brought it home, uh -huh. and it had uh, roughly 80 references in it. And yeah. uh, so... Uh, what were you I, studying at the time? What were you researching when you were when you discovered his I, paper? I was a physiologist, and I mm -hmm. was interested in body composition mm -hmm. and how diet influenced body composition mm -hmm. and uh, uh, lung function and uh, a few other factors. So yeah. uh, that's kind of how I, I came to it. So when you, what was it like when you first met and chatted with Dr. Eaton? Tell me about that. Oh God, I was scared shitless. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> he was my hero. Oh, it's really? like yeah. meeting Joe DiMaggio, you know? Yeah. It's like, I've been reading, because he didn't just publish one paper, he published a series of paper. Right. And uh, so I had read them all and it's like, oh my God, I'm going to see Boyd Eaton. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, I, I finally got up enough courage one day. Yeah. To call him, and this was, I think, in 1990 or the early 90s, and I called him, yeah. and he's a complete gentleman. He's a total yeah. definition of a gentleman and a nice guy. Yeah. He talked to me for over an hour, and at the end of that conversation, he said, well, it sounds to me you know more about this than I do. So it was really, <laughs> it was one of the greatest compliments of my life. Yeah. And, and so I talked to him and I invited him to come up to CSU and uh, give a, a talk and he did. About 90 people showed up for it. Yeah. And Did he just present his paper? What did he talk about? Uh, he talked about the concept and yeah. he, he was 
in the day, you know, we didn't have PowerPoint. So uh, he, he used uh, slides. Right. And, uh, you know, they were okay. But, I mean, okay, they were great for the day. Right. But they're nothing like what we can do with PowerPoint right. now. And uh, I mean, it'd be appropriate if he etched it on stone for the Paleolithic times. You know, like, <laughs> it should, shouldn't even be on, you shouldn't be allowed to ever present on PowerPoint. Yeah, so anyway, uh, uh, it was uh, it was a, a very good day. I got to know him, and uh, we clicked. We hit it off. He stayed at my house before we had children, and uh, uh, at that point, we he uh, we decided we should write some articles together. And mm-hmm. He knew Artemis Samopoulos, and Artemis, uh, of course, is one of the major players in in the Omega-3 story, the history mm-hmm. of the Omega-3 story, he knew her, and she was putting on a conference, health and nutrition conference, mm. in Greece. And so uh, he called her up and said, you got to get this guy Cordain to come mm. give a talk. And so I did, and that was, I didn't even have a passport. That's how <laughs> naive things were. And so I, I, I got myself a passport, and I went to, to Greece, and I gave a talk, and uh, yeah. it was, it went very well. What did you and, speak on? I spoke about, upon the evolutionary basis for or for fitness, exercise, and fitness. Yeah. And time we had just completed a a paper, uh, and it hadn't. I don't think it had been accepted yet. So we just had completed a paper on the topic, which we eventually wrote too. Um, and uh, then I kind of stopped writing on uh, you know the fitness and aerobic capacity stuff and. And that, and, and focus more on nutrition. When he presented at, you know, when you brought him in to speak, did he have a formalized plan for the actual diet, or was he just talking in general about Paleolithic nutrition? Who was that? Um, Dr. Eden, early on. Cause... Um, well, he didn't have a, a formalized plan. It was, it was more like just friends coming together and mm-hmm. discussing ideas. So yeah. it's not like he laid out a a series of ideas. We're going to do this, 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 and this. I'm just curious if he said like early on, he's like, you should not eat dairy. Like, did he have those paleo diet well, rules at that you time? You know, he didn't, he didn't really say so much as what modern people should eat. He, if you go back to that New England Journal paper in 85, yeah. he says, this is what Stone Age people ate. Gotcha. We should emulate their characteristics. And then in 88, he wrote his first book, um, which was called Paleolithic, Paleolithic Nutrition of All Things, but it was way before its time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it, or no, the Paleolithic Prescription is what he called it. Mm. And uh, I, it, it so well, but it, it just kind of fizzled. It was, it was, nobody was interested. The internet w- didn't exist. Mm. The timing was off, you think? And, he, and also he, he had a couple of co-authors, uh, Marjorie Shostak and... Uh, Connor and, and those two guys had convinced him, you're never going to sell a book if you you say you can't eat whole grains. He said that. that, that <laughs> you're yeah, that's, that's people off. So they convinced Boyd to, to say it's okay to eat whole grains mm. and it's okay to eat dairy. So it really wasn't a paleo diet. It yeah. was uh, uh, it was just a, a healthier diet, but um, so so that. And doesn't that sound familiar today? It's like right. We well, got that's, a, that's why I wanted to talk about the a bunch of all the people yeah. that are out there. Some of the the quote unquote leaders, people that have never published a scientific paper, they've never looked. Uh, they're telling thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people what they should and should not eat, and they've never published a single scientific peer reviewed right. paper. Mm-hmm. And they're telling people that it's okay to eat. Uh, kefir it's okay to occasionally eat legumes and you know and I, I agree with it occasionally but you it, it's like that's a right. real bad example to so right. if it's occasional what does that mean so yeah. i i prefer to say um it, the 85 15 rule give it a try if it works you're okay with it you can do but be very very careful yeah. so so anyway yeah i mean i want you to talk about that a little bit because you know, when I do the research, obviously I look at everything's out there and, you know, I look at credentials. So, I mean, I obviously the paleo diet, it's like the gold standard. 
Um, but a lot of people aren't credentialed or have they done research and they're saying things, you know, paleo in one side of their mouth and then dairy in the other side. And I'm thinking, well, hmm, that is not what's in the paleo diet book. So I want to hear from you so people understand what, well, you know, what well, is considered the paleo, the true paleo well, diet. That, I mean, you, you know, it's just. You don't have to be a scientist to figure this stuff out. You can just use your head and logic. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're from Chicago, yeah. and uh, if you get, I don't know, 50 to 100 miles out of Chicago in Illinois, you got white-tailed deer. Here in Chicago or in Colorado, we get 50 or 100 miles outside of Fort Collins, and we got everything. We got elk and antelope mm -hmm. and, and, and so forth. Uh, have you ever tried to walk up to a wild animal? Uh, they run. <laughs> yeah, well, ha have you ever tried to milk a wild animal? <laughs> no. Okay. I have not. <laughs> okay, so, so end, of, end of option is that right. unless you domesticate animals, you can't milk them. Right. So you don't have a source for milk. Right. So you don't have a source for dairy. Yeah. So if you take a look at it in, in the broader perspective... Uh, we only domesticated animals. So this is the whole thing about void eating in the papers and what, what have you. Is yeah. like if, if we've only domesticated animals for 10,000 years, well, how long has that been? It's been about 300 generations. Yeah. Is that en enough time to allow the entire world's genome hmm. to adapt to? Uh, and this is just one part of dairy is sure. lactose. And about 65% of the pe world's people are lactose intolerant. Sure. Why is that? Because we simply haven't had enough evolutionary time to to evolve mm. those specific genes yeah. that code for the enzymes which allow us to break down lactose. So anybody, I don't care whether, well, I, I guess I shouldn't name names. <laughs> I'll let Lane Sebring name names. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll make a note of that. Like Lane, name names. Yeah, name, name names of who, who the idiots are that are saying these things. <laughs> So, uh, uh, you mean they're you saying know, that dairy is part of paleo is what they're saying, which right. is right. Yeah. And, and so these are the very same people that say it's okay to eat legumes. Yeah. Well, we can d draw the same thing. You don't have to be a scientist to see why for most of the time that humans lived on the planet, legumes were toxic. You know, when I say toxic, I'm saying not lethally toxic, but they cause symptoms from lethality from killing you to mild symptoms and like gas or something well yeah gas mm -hmm. but uh you're eating, for most people even eating cooked beans uh causes problems so uh, and eating raw beans are are very close to lethally toxic red kidney beans there's believe it or not in the british medical journal there's an article showing that uh Uncooked red kidney beans are can be lethally toxic to really? humans. Oh, I had no yeah. idea. Wow. Yeah, and the same thing with um, raw potatoes. Yeah. Is um, potatoes contain what are called anti nutrients? Yeah. And uh, solanine, alpha solanine, and alpha shikonine are a couple of anti nutrients that uh, our guts don't deal with very well at all, and. So these are the same people that are telling people to eat uh, beans and legumes and mm -hmm. uh, potatoes and, and so forth. Well, we can eat them if we can if we can cook the living hell out of them. <laughs> and so my point is is that right. uh, uh, you have to ha to cook. You have to have fire. Right. And, yeah. And so you you not only have to have the ability to control fire, which is one thing, you have to have the ability to make fire at will. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, there's absolutely no evidence, well, I won't say no, but the best available evidence suggests that the ability to control fire, in other words, to gather it after it was started by lightning or maybe a volcanic eruption or or other means, yeah. mainly by lightning, um, to to capture it and control it. That's a tough thing to do to keep it alive because we don't have indoors except for caves. 
There's no indoors. So it's it's tough to keep a fire going right. for over a year yeah. if you can't reignite it. The elements so, will just put it out. Yeah, and, yeah. And, right. And so that's exactly what archaeologists have found is that in Europe, 300,000 years ago, is they had prob- probably were able to control fire. They got lightning strikes. They kept it alive for months on end, and then it went out. And we know that because during cold periods in Europe, Neanderthals huddled in their caves with no fire. Mm-hmm. And so why would they do that if they had the ability to, to make fire? Mm-hmm. So how does that relate to modern diet? Yeah. Well, it means until humans figured out how to make fire at will, then we probably couldn't <clears throat> eat foods that are basically indigestible without fire. Right. And so that takes out whole categories of foods. Like I said, <clears throat> tubers, uh, potatoes, legumes, whole categories of foods make you sick if you try to eat them raw. Yeah. So, uh, so those same geniuses that tell us that we can <laughs> eat dairy products with no problem, they simply haven't read the literature. Yeah. So coming from your mouth, you know, obviously, str- you know, strict paleo or true paleo would be no dairy, no legumes, no potatoes, and no grains. And vegetables, fruits, and then wild meats, right? You know, the thing is, is first off, let's, yeah. let's get one thing straight, yeah. is that we can't eat the way our hunter-gatherer ancestors ate, period. Mm-hmm. It can't be done. So first off, we don't have the cultural traditions to eat in that manner. Yeah. Is uh, eating uh, uh, raw kidney sound very palatable to you? No, well, if you're hungry enough, it would. But uh, so we kind of have to, that's why the paleo diet, what we've tried to do is we've tried to make it palatable with modern foods right. that emulate the food groups yeah. that our ancestors ate. Right. But clearly they, they didn't have anything that looked like a, you know, a modern apple. It was, they looked like crab apples. And they right. taste crab apples. So... Uh, we've done studies on wild and uh, uh, versus um, domesticated plants. Mm-hmm. I've done that work with Jenny Brand Miller at the University of Sydney. Yeah. And uh, yeah, what'd you find? Well, we found uh, that uh, if you compare domestic uh, fruits and vegetables to their wild counterparts, they tend to have less fiber more sugar, but, mm-hmm. and slightly lower vitamins, not much difference in minerals, but overall they look pretty much like one another within plus or minus 5%. Mm-hmm. So, so the bottom line is, is that uh, domestic plants that can be eaten without fire uh, are probably okay. They're probably not a problem. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, what's considered on, most controversial in the book that you, the feedback you get from people who read it or online? Well, it depends on who you're talking to. Yeah. If you're talking to the uh, USDA uh, <laughs> registered dietitians, right? Yeah, uh, they say it's harmful to eliminate food groups, entire categories of food groups, but mm-hmm. actually. Uh, that's, it's not true because yeah. we've shown in multiple papers that by eliminating grains and dairy, it actually increases the nutrient density of the 13 vitamins and minerals most lacking in the mm-hmm. U.S. diet. And, that, and the reason for that is because uh, the nutrient density of fruits, vegetables, meat, seafood, fish, eggs, yeah. and so forth are much greater than uh, our grains or dairy Mm -hmm. what have you found with the research on dairy because it's not just what you think but it's also the research that you've done too well one of the tricky things about dairy is is that the average person when you think about it it's just this white milky substance tastes a little bit sweet end of story but what the function of of milk is, is to 
help a young suckling animal to, to develop uh, immunity. And yeah. So multiple factors uh, built into milk uh, hormones. There's roughly 40 or 50 hormones yeah. in milk uh, that end up potentially getting in the gut, and uh, and they get through not just in uh, when children are born, they tend to have a leaky gut. Mm-hmm. So so. The, the function of that is to allow those hormones and peptides and other factors in milk to get into their immune system. Mm-hmm. And uh, it turns out that uh, those compounds actually seem to get into adults. For instance, um, estrogen and estrogen mm-hmm. compounds yeah. in dairy seem to be able to... Uh, uh, bypass the gut barrier and, and get into uh, circulation and interact with the immune system, particularly if you're eating cereal grains and other factors that, and beans and, and what have you. So the, the, one of the keys to, and then let's get Lane on because I've been hogging the phone. No, no, no. I told them, the, I told them we, we'd uh, call them in like 15 minutes anyway. So it's, yeah, we'll get, you get ready. Cause you know, um, so one of the keys, and you know, you're a, a chiropractic physician, and you realize that, that uh, one of the keys to any chronic disease, be it autoimmune disease, cancer, heart disease, right, um, is inflammation. Yeah. Chronic low-level inflammation. Mm-hmm. We used to think about heart disease as a disease, a plumbing disease. It was you're getting too much cholesterol. Right in your arteries, and end of story. Now, I, I, I don't think you're going to find any uh, first-rate uh, cardiologist who is in the trenches studying cardiovascular disease that would even risk saying that because it's a ridiculous statement anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a, an interaction of our immune system with mm-hmm. environmental factors. And mm-hmm. so... Uh, that's really what what's driving. You can't have cancer, you can't have heart disease, and you can't have autoimmune disease without chronic low-level inflammation. And so what it's kind of coming down to is that uh, what are those factors that uh, uh, drive uh, chronic low-level inflammation? Mm-hmm. And the largest interface between our bodies and the outside world is what? Their skin. No. The skin is, unless you cut it, is pretty much impervious to the outside world. The the gut uh, health? Yeah, the gut. So we have about 200 square meters of surface area in our gut because it's got villi that line it and... Uh, uh, so it, it's coming down to the gut biome, the types of bacteria and, and other critters that are down in our gut mm-hmm. that uh, line our gut. And, and also, uh, our, our gut tends to be leaky. We tend to have the way the gut is structured. It, there are mechanisms which deliberately sample what's in the content of the gut. And then there are mechanisms in which uh, those peptides and proteins in the gut escape because uh, c- we don't absorb proteins, we absorb peptides. And, and we absorb actually not peptides, but amino acids. So um, peptides and proteins are not supposed to get past the gut barrier. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And when they do, it causes problems. Yeah. I mean, you talk about in the book too, which is really interesting, um, the atherosclerosis, like you said, with the inflammation, and you also talk about the protein to carbohydrate ratios too. I think humans can live on a a variety of protein to carbohydrate ratios. Mm -hmm. Um, Typically, hunter-gatherers, they had more animal food than they had plant foods, and Mm -hmm. so... We, we base that observation on the work we've done with the worldwide hunter-gatherers and published a paper in 2000 and 
2000, I guess, um, in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. And uh, it, it turns out that uh, a little more than half of the calories from the typical hunter-gatherer diet come from from plant foods. Yeah. Or and not from animal foods. Mm-hmm. The... You know, obviously, you know, like you said, the the paleo diet, uh, you have the revised edition. What made you create the revised edition? What changed from the first one to the second book? My editor told me to do it. <laughs> I'm sure there's some, some other reasons. Yeah, well, he, yeah, he, he said you got to update this thing. And so uh, because at the time when I wrote it in 2002, yeah. Um. You know, science changes. It's right, like, uh, exactly. So, uh, we went eight years, 2002 to 2010, particularly biological sciences. They changed just dramatically in two or three years. So mm-hmm. in 2002, we went from believing that, you know, heart disease was caused by too much cholesterol and, and fat in our diet, uh, which to a degree, there's still a certain amount of truth in that. But it's way more complex than that. And so the complexity has to do with the immune system. Uh, So we need to factor in those new variables. uh, And, you know, science is constantly changing. And so I'm glad my my editor made me rewrite it. If I would rewrite it today, I'd change some stuff as well. What would you change? Oh, God. I'd have to look at it. You know, it's 80,000 words. <laughs> right. <laughs> you live this stuff. That kind of stuff on the top of my head, I got... Yeah. Yeah, right. I got the basic ideas yeah. on the top of the head, yeah. um, but I'd have to go back. Yeah. Because you, know, you mentioned I, some oils that changed, I think, from the first to the second one, right? Um. Yeah, I, I did. And yeah. so, uh, you know... It, First off, oils. No hunter gatherer ever had any oils whatsoever. So, you mean they you weren't wanna... squeezing avocado in, into a container? Right. No, I'm just kidding. they were squeezing corn oil, and yeah, no, right. that, that didn't occur. Um, so, what you have to do is you have to look at the fatty acid profile. You have to look at the relative composition of one fatty mm-hmm. acid to another, mm-hmm. and uh, what you're trying to do is to emulate the composition of fats that they would get through eating whole foods and whole animal foods in a uh, in an edible oil. And so what we, what we were trying to do with that was trying to make the diet more palatable. So I, if I told you, you you could only eat wild animal foods and wild plant foods the entire planet would starve. <laughs> right. You know, it, it would, wouldn't be the paleo diet. It would be the impossible diet. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you have unlimited funds uh, to go to Whole Foods or something, but yes. Yeah, well, so so you got to make it palatable. you right. got to make it uh, available Realistic. to yeah. people, yet still maintain some of the nutritional characteristics. Yeah. The problem is, is that when you extract oils from a plant food source, you're not only extracting oils, you're also extracting anti-nutrients. All plants have anti-nutrients in mm-hmm. them. So you got to make sure that the any potential factors in those oils uh, aren't going to cause problems. And right. when I first wrote the book in 2002, uh, there wasn't a whole lot out on canola oil, and mm. now there is. Yeah. So canola oil looks like, on paper, it's, it's a healthy... Uh, oil in terms of its fatty acid composition. It's mm-hmm. got lots of 18,3N3, which is called alpha-linolenic acid, mm-hmm. and it's got little alpha-linoleic acid. So it tends to have a good omega-3 to omega-6 ratio, but it has anti-nutrients in it that seem to cause people problems. Mm. And one of them is called erucic acid. It's another fatty acid that is unique. I won't say unique, but it's it's found in in canola oil. And erucic acid has uh, been shown to cause problems because it tends to be toxic to the the intima, the cells lining the, the arteries, mm-hmm. and, uh, at least in animal models. Yeah. So, 
So uh, people should if, stick to which oils, would you say? Um, just We have a whole list of oils. Um, I think olive oil is, is a good starting point. Yeah. It, it's been tested, time-tested over the years, uh, you know, 5,000 years, yeah. people eating it. So uh, olive oil is a pretty good oil to to eat. Some of the others, avocado oil seems to be pretty much benign. It's got a, a high monounsaturated fat mm-hmm. level. Uh, what else? Uh, flax oil probably is okay, but there's there's a little bit of problems in that, uh, you know, chronic consumption of flax oil sometimes has been shown to be increased risk for prostate cancer, sometimes not. So the story's still out there. I, mm. I would say that olive oil, you can pretty much do what you want. You can cook with it. You can pour it on your salad dressing. Yeah. And it's about the cheapest. You get yeah. into the other oils and the, these exotic oils like macadamia nut oil and walnut oil. Walnut oil and, and what have you. Walnut oil is probably okay, but, um, you know, when you think about what walnuts are, is that they are the seeds of a, a plant. And if that seed doesn't get into the ground, uh, then the, the plant can't survive. And, and I'm not saying that there's anything wrong whatsoever with eating walnuts, um, but typically you, you, what I look for as a scientist is that uh, is that there probably are anti-nutrients in all nuts just like they're in all plants mm-hmm. liver has, our liver has a system that allows us to detoxify all kinds of stuff so just because a, a plant has a, su- a compound in it that is toxic doesn't mean that it's not necessarily good for us. So mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a it's a complicated. Right. But when we have a- animal data and we have tissue data that shows that that compound is toxic in a dose dependent manner, meaning yeah. that the more you get of it, then you need to be cautious. Yeah. We're yeah. getting into some of the the obscure, far off ends of paleo that I don't know that. You know, I think you, people are interested in this because it's stuff they cook with. And you always hear stuff about good fats and bad fats and what oils. So, you know, people are probably overusing in our everyday meals preparation, you know. Well, I would stay away from the oils. Yeah. And uh, most people can't go wrong with the extra virgin olive oil. There is something that I do want to warn the readers of that I just found out about. It's like six minutes about, uh, I don't know, a month or two ago. Uh, it turns out that the mafia have their hand in "quote unquote" virgin olive oil from Italy. Really? So what they're doing is they're taking cheap oil like corn oil and mm. and uh, other oils, and then they're putting a little bit of green dye in it, making it look like olive oil. Really? So, yeah, and they're making a huge profit on it. Go online and, and how did check they out. how did they discover that um, that that was happening? People just tested it or something? Yeah, I, I don't recall the exact yeah. details. But they got into it. Wow. So the mafia was is making you know like eighty five ninety percent profit on oils. Wow, taking common cheap oils and and dyeing it like uh, olive oil. So that's one thing to be careful of. Wow, that's let's crazy. get uh, let's get yeah. Lane well, here. Let's call Lane on the the phone. One last question about your research before we. I'm going to call Lane. Um, what do you consider one of your proudest or best research discoveries through? Because I know you have over a hundred peer-reviewed uh, scientific articles, what's one to point people towards they should check more uh, out on? On my website, I, I believe we're having a, a little bit of difficulty with my website these mm-hmm. days, but on my website, I believe I've got the top 10 right. articles. You can see all of them. You, know you, can, you, yeah, you can see all of them. Some of them, of them I, you click through and you have to register for the... You know, I tried to click through on all of them. You have to register for that particular journal or something. Yes, yeah. there there are some articles that aren't mine, and okay. the way that um, the scientific community works is not all articles are available for free. Right, so some exactly. Article, uh, you have to have a subscription to or pay for, and so you know, unfortunately, I don't have any control over that. That is the policy of the journal. For sure. 
So uh, some of them are good. And, well, <laughs> most of them that we put out there are, uh, are worth looking at. But uh, all of my papers are available for free. Yeah, which is which is one of your favorites or proudest that we should everyone should check out. And then go on the paleodiet.com backslash research to see yeah, all of them. That actually, um, instead of me making that, comp, uh, you know, adjustment, look at what uh, we have a, a category that is my top 10. Top 10 publications, yeah. Top 10 publications. And if you look at that, um, you know, I'm proud of all mine. So. <laughs> right. um, let me... Uh, Call up Lane, Dr. Sebring, and get him on the line. All right. So I'll let you chat. I just wanted to first just uh, see how you guys first met and uh, talk about that for a second, and then you can have at it. Well, I've been talking for an hour, so Lane, why don't you Lane, tell him? Dr. Sebring, what, um, how'd you guys first meet? Uh, at Boulder Fest, and I'm... I'm thinking it was about 1999, uh, if I remember right. Um, you hadn't written your book yet, and I remember even for a couple of of uh, Boulder Fest uh, after that, I, people were coming up to you, you got to write a book, please write a book. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, everybody thought, wow, that would be excellent. So you wrote you wrote the book, and I think that was in uh, 2002. Yeah, I, it, it came out in, uh, I believe it was... January of 2002. So, okay, yeah. Uh, but it was, right. it was a Boulder Fest, and uh, it's kind of funny because going back to those times, uh, uh, I, I didn't know who Lane was, and he barely knew who I was. And uh, so a fellow by the name of Robert Crayon was putting on the Boulder Fest. Uh, God bless his soul. He's no longer with us. But uh, yeah. Robert was uh, putting on the uh, Boulder Fest, and he got – people together and in those days it was a really a pretty small group wasn't it lane well there were 14 people in the classroom when you were speaking there and i just thought <laughs> when i recognized the magnitude of your message after about five minutes into your lecture i think it was uh cereal grains humanities double-edged sword and uh and i I thought, you know, I realized at that moment I, I was incredibly privileged. I think I was the only MD in, in the room. There were there were chiropractors and nutritionists and so maybe a few dietitians, but uh, I was I was uh, almost I felt like a duck out of water. But this I took to it immediately just because you you demonstrated a a concept that just changed my my entire world and my understanding of health. And I you know. I, I was convinced that the rest of the world is going to be doing that diet within the next two to three years because it made so much sense. You know? <laughs> so. <laughs> well, thank you, Lane. That was, uh, uh, you know, a very nice compliment. And uh, I've known Lane throughout the years uh, ever since then. And what are we now? It's, you know, 16 or 17 years beyond. Yeah. And who would ever thought that we would have gone from those humble beginnings to where mm -hmm. paleo has become today? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And so Lane has actually been in the middle of this. He's been one of the the physicians um, that has advocated this whole concept and uh, a very powerful ally of mine and a good friend as well. So uh, I don't know if I've ever told you this, but thank you very much. <laughs> well, my pleasure. I mean, I, you know, I, it's it's kind of like after listening to your lecture, the, the, it's exactly the same. Once you hear that, once you understand it, once you understand what your message is and what kind of person you are, you say, how not? How could I not be uh, an ally and, and uh, supporting? And I just, uh, uh, once you understand, it's kind of like discovering, I wrote an article once, have you ever discovered a truth? And uh, that was that was new to you, and it took you so much farther than you ever imagined. And uh, that's what paleo has has really been all about. It's, uh, well, um, it, it's it's a, a truth that I discovered for myself too, but I didn't discover it. Boyd Eaton is the guy that turned me on to it in 1987. And one of the the crazy things about this that you probably can tell the readers or the listeners yourself is that I had no idea in 1999 where we were going to go with this. Uh, you know, I'm not a dermatologist, but we went into that whole acne thing. I'm not an immunologist, but we went into the, the autoimmune deal. And so it's, uh, 
uh, and I'm not a, an ophthalmologist, but we went into the, the myopia. So it's, it's an absolutely amazing um, where this thing goes if you uh, follow it to its logical conclusion. Yeah, exactly. You know, w- the, this, this new template that was kind of, you know, dropped in my lap for measuring what medicine was doing as being rational or uh, out of its mind uh, regarding you know, what, what is health, what are we supposed to do? Well, that's never been defined by modern medicine. And now, you know, we have these hunter-gatherers that are more healthy than we ever imagined we could be. And so that that was that was very exciting. And so what I think, you know, what you were benefiting from in going into those areas with much greater insight than than someone who grew up in ophthalmology, so to speak, or grew up in immunology, was uh, a very different perspective mm-hmm. in recognizing, you know, what you're not, what you're not, uh, uh, you're not, you know, you recognize that. Those diseases are not normal. Hmm. They're they're not natural. There's something unnatural going on here. It's not a matter of getting old or, or just being a human being, and, and that's our fate. You, you begin to look at it with very fresh eyes. You know, a lot of times it's it's great to have a an artist uh, talk to the engineer, and uh, and and to recognize. You know, there's a there's a website I think that allows engineers to go and, and, and look at biologists and ask them questions and say, you know, how did nature handle this problem? And they usually have a pretty good idea that uh, through an evolutionary process that nature's come up with a great way of handling this engineering problem that the engineers are trying to tackle. And, and I think that's what gave you a much more powerful view uh, and insight into those problems. Yeah, you know, I've looked at that over the years, and it's kind of, interesting how you come to these things and uh, I would agree that uh, I I look at it in a a very similar manner is that there is a a system of engineering that is guiding um, our biological (laughs) our bodies and uh, when you look at it in that regard it's like hmm okay It, it does make sense this is the system evolution through natural selection that designed all biological functions. Well, I can't say all, but virtually all biological functions. And when we understand that, it just allows us insight into modern-day problems. So uh, one of the the quotes that I like uh, that comes out of this is that uh, um, nothing in the light of uh, nothing under uh, I got to get this quote right but nothing under the light of evolution nothing in bio, uh, here's nothing in biology makes sense except under the light of evolution and you could yeah. turn that thing around and you could say nothing in nutrition makes sense except in the light of evolution hmm. absolutely right yeah. and how now you're armed if you understand the, the dynamics of evolution and how that works, and unfortunately not all that many people do, but once you understand that, then you can, you can apply that to nutrition. And you can listen. I tell my patients that all the time. I say, you know, you, now you have a template. You have a way of measuring out what some other doctor is telling you, what somebody on TV is, what you read in a book. Does this make sense? Because a lot of times it doesn't when you look at nutrition in the uh, with the the paleo template or with the evolutionary um, dynamics. Yeah, I think that's really Lane. That's the strength of this idea is that uh, it's uh, in so many ways it's a simple idea, but it can become complicated and complex in many ways when you try to get at it. So, uh, but if you use that template as the the guideline, then it, it helps to solve problems. Yeah, it really does. I know, you know it's been a long time that you've chatted, uh, since you've chatted, Dr. Sebring. I don't know, are there certain kind of questions that you wanted <laughs> to address I, with Dr. Cordain? Yeah, I do. Uh, I, I hope you don't mind. I, you know, some things that we talked about, you know, on that first lecture, you talked about how the, um, 
we ended up when when grains were added to the diet, you know, the, that uh, osteoporosis really began uh, for a few different reasons uh, because of the introduction of grains, which you know before was not human food was really not consumed in any large amounts, and that we ended up with smaller brains, and we ended up with a jaw that was no longer large enough to hold all of our teeth. We lost about six to seven inches in height. And this followed the introduction of grains all around the world. And I was wondering, um, I've, I've heard some arguments that the sphenoid bone, and I've said it myself, but I wasn't sure if you had any uh, more information about the sphenoid bone being uh, that, that, you know, that supports the brain and is uh, back behind the eyes. It kind of buttresses the sides of the skull. And, but it wasn't strong enough to span that original distance uh, after the introduction of grains, and, and basically all modern people now have a, a form of osteoporosis by comparison to our hunter-gatherers. If, if that was the reason uh, for the narrowing of the face, or is that too simple? You know, Lane, I, that's an area, you know, obviously I haven't thought about everything um, I, I've heard that argument before, and it makes a lot of sense to me. Um, but uh, you know, to reconstruct a, a, you know a face of of a person that is no longer alive, um, you know, there's probably other factors in, involved. But uh, it, it makes a lot of sense to me. Okay. Yeah. And and unfortunately, I think we're seeing that that same. Uh, change being more and more exaggerated in more recent times. I, I think when I was a child, I think uh, I saw, I remember people with a little wider faces. I have a, uh, a high school annual from uh, one of my uh, aunts in, in, the, in the 1930s and 40s, and, and virtually everyone had a nice, you know, broad, wide face by comparison to what we tend to see today even. So I think it's continuing to, to change. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that uh, we have become... Uh, more and more dependent on processed foods. I just read an article that I hadn't wasn't aware of. It was an article that was I don't know written in the early 20s about a woman who had put children on a basically paleo type diet and uh, wanted to see what their ha appetites were and how they developed. And I, I got to looking at the the diet that she advocated, and it was just crazy is like even as recent as the 1918s, 1920s, uh, there was very little processed food compared to what we have today. Right. And, and that's what we're seeing. Those children seem to be doing much better. I was just reading an article on that earlier today. Um, okay. Another question, you know, do you, here's something else. I always try to legitimize, you know, our, our hunter-gatherer brethren and our ancestors to my patients, you know, to to take away the the stigma that people think that they were just barely eking out of existence, you know, huddled here, huddled there, hiding from predators, uh, you know, shriveling from their surroundings. But in fact, you know, they were masters of their environment and uh, um, were were quite amazingly capable. When you tell them they have an average of two and a half hour workday. Uh, that sort of gets their people's attention. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it does. I think that, uh, you know, part of the problem is is that when we look at the, the surviving hunter-gatherers, uh, what people are left in, uh, you know, into historical times that we could study, uh, these people, they, and they weren't studied very well at all. We just have little tiny glimpses of them. Uh, but I have come up with the same impression from my readings is that uh, one of the best groups that we have are, are the Plains Indians that you know that can kind of come close to what our ancestors did. You know, some of them had a little bit of corn, uh, but a lot of them didn't, and they were pretty much eating, uh, you know, bison and elk and, and what have you. And uh, you know, I, I've got these 19th century descriptions of them and it's it's amazing uh, you know what is said how they look how tall they were uh, how muscular the men were and in, in a couple of my books I, I think actually with the one I wrote with Joe Friel on the, the paleo diet uh, for athletes right. I started off with a series of about a half dozen or a dozen um, quote 
quotations from these early uh, explorers and, and, and what have you that, that contacted these folks. So uh, it, it, it reflects exactly what you're saying, Lane, is that these guys uh, were masters of their environment and you know, they they did a lot of things that we w- couldn't even get behind. You know, infanticide and constant warring with their neighbors, and you know, uh, it, you know. But it was a different culture in different times. But if you look at externally, their health was good. Right, right. And th- in uh, in Jared Diamond's book, he wrote uh, in Guns, Germs, and Steel. One of the things he alludes to in there, uh, from his 33 years of experience with hunter-gatherers, he concluded that the, the uh, native New Guinea people were on average more intelligent, alert, expressive, and, and uh, more interested in things and people around them than the average European and American. Have you ever run across any uh, other people that talk about the uh, a superior intelligence in some way with these people? You know, I it's hard to say, but I think that they were better adjusted to their environment and um, one of the you know that's kind of a component the the psychological behavioral component that I haven't gotten into much but uh, I've other people have written about it and uh, it it seems to be true is that um, all people had essentially equal functions Uh, in hunter-gatherer groups there rarely was a quote-unquote king or queen there may have been a a person that uh, helped to make the decisions and was the talisman or whatever. But uh, for the most part, everybody did everything. Well, I won't say everybody, but because uh, women were treated differently than men. But uh, and so, but for the most part, uh, healthy people in the environment uh, had equal potential, and so. Uh, kind of equality yeah. type situation. Right. Yeah. You, um, it's uh, One thing that I can say is that I, you got me thinking about this is that uh, uh, there there were studies and have been studies done by audiologists right into the, you know, the 1950s because we had the technology to measure hearing and the hearing was practically an order of magnitude better. So, uh, They'd be standing out in the plains of you know, Serengeti, and these hunter gatherers would look up quick and they say, "You hear that? There's an airplane coming in through here." <laughs> and the white guys are going, "What? What are you talking?" About? <laughs> <laughs> so they, their hearing was uh, incredibly acute, and I think the reason for it is is there are very few loud natural sounds uh, in the environment, and in this day and age, mm. we're bombarded with you know, automobiles and trains and planes and stereos and God knows what else. But, uh, yeah, it seems to never stop actually. Yeah. (laughs) Doesn't go away. Uh, You know, another question I would like to ask you too. Um, we were talking earlier about how the, the, the paleo diet has really kind of begun to really take off quickly now, you know, in the last few years, it's been amazing to see. And I, I think part of that was, uh, you know, finally enough groundswell of people were were examples of the result of following the paleo diet to get people's attention. And, you know, that sort of thing starts to grow almost logarithmically at that point. And also, I think, you know, CrossFit gyms adopted it. And then you have these people who are doing, uh, you know, a, a reasonable exercise routine and then also following paleo. And, and I got a lot of patients from them that said, oh, yeah, there's a, do- there's a paleo doctor right here, you know. So, uh <laughs> there was all immediate kinship and and I didn't have to teach him too much about paleo diet. Yeah, no, I I think you're absolutely right. But, uh, Lane, think back to when we first met, what basically, what major technological advance was just barely getting started. Right. Um, The internet. Yeah. Yeah, So I I had (laughs) talking with the interviewer here, I had a, it was kind of interesting. We, we were talking about that, and I said, yeah, well, Google just got started in 1998, and the average person in the early or the late 90s and early 2000s, they didn't even have a computer in their home. And, you know, 
uh, cell phones or smartphones were way into the future. Uh, all the social media, all that stuff was yet to come. And so I think uh, when you talk about a groundswell, it's like, yeah, okay, there's a good idea. But now anybody with a, a smartphone can talk to anybody else, and they do. And I think that's, if this idea didn't work, if it was a dumb idea, it caused your blood cholesterol to go up, your blood pressure to go up, uh, you know, it made you feel worse, it would have died a death long ago. And right. so it, your point is well taken, is that it works. People talk to one another now very easily, and they talk to uh, the largest network of humanity that's ever been created, the inter Internet. And so uh, that's, that's why it's where it is. And I, I agree with you that we got a, a tremendous boost from the CrossFit people. And uh, so, so I think yeah. those are the, the key elements that, that made it work. I wanted to ask you, too, what, what are your thoughts? I mean, it's, it's always inevitable. You see what happens uh, you know, Christianity develops in in, uh, in in Europe, and then it just starts with all these splinter groups. You know, they got the Protestant and the Catholics, and 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 all subclasses of that. Th things start to develop, and everybody has their own little idea about this. And so, I was wondering what your thoughts are on on the you know the, a lot of people are having different ideas. Uh, um, I saw a question on the internet: Is uh, is free range dairy paleo? You know. And so uh, and I think I've, I've answered that. I said, not no, but hell no. And I said, Lane, it's funny. I said the same thing uh, earlier in this interview is that uh, completely not. It's, it's not okay. And we could spend the next hour talking on why it's not. But uh, right. the, the, the factor that kind of got me onto this, because, you know, I, I believed like, many Americans still do is that dairy products are something that, you know, the milk mustache and, and so forth. It's something next to the American pie and motherhood. Um, <laughs> but it, it's actually not. It's, uh, uh, you know, dairy products are a compound that are meant to, to make another species young, grow fast, develop immunity, and then get the hell out. You stop it after a while. No other species drinks another species uh, milk for their lifetime. And it's turning out that there's lots of problems associated with it, um, one of which is, you know, the simplest of which is the glycemic index and the glycemic load. The group at Harvard, Walt Willett and company, uh, are now, uh, you know, honing in, at least from the epidemiological perspective, on milk and prostate cancer. So that seems to be a real strong link. And it, it just goes on and on and on. And so milk and atherosclerosis. And, and, you know, I can see the dairy people. They don't want to hear this. It's like their livelihoods are based on this. Mm -hmm. But uh, other people's lives are based on it. Too. Other people's lives are based on doing this. You don't need milk. Evolution through natural selection has solved the calcium conundrum. It's like we can build strong bones without drinking dairy products or eating dairy products. So uh, I, I think that uh, you're right. It's kind of like Christianity. It split, it, you know, went this way, it went that. And there are now people that are influencing people through the Internet um, saying that a little bit of kefir is not bad for you. And go ahead and have a few beans. And, oh, by the way, da-da-da-da-da-da. And it's like... Right. Wow, we have gotten so far from the original concept, which developed, uh, was mentioned in here, it, it developed in the scientific community. This, this didn't start out as a popular notion through books. This was started out as a concept on what were then known as primitive listservs. We now call them blogs. This was a, uh, one of the very earliest uh, outcomes of the Internet was it allowed scientists to talk to one another in small groups. And that's really where this thing came from after Boyd Eaton's wow. paper that was published in 1985 in the New England Journal. And I kind of uh, point people to that and say that was really the, the impetus that started uh, the modern-day 
concept of a quote-unquote paleo diet. Right. Yeah, it's it's really been uh, an amazing adventure. I have to tell you a short story, though, It's uh, it, that happened at Boulder Fest. I was sitting there one morning in the Boulderado Cafe having breakfast, and and I had uh, the fellow next to me sat down and was looking at the syllabus for the for the conference, and it was going to start in about 15 minutes the first day. And he had a bowl of oatmeal and uh, a bran muffin and a glass of orange juice. <laughs> and and I had a, I had a, a uh, three eggs, uh, a small uh, breakfast steak, and a, a quarter of a cantaloupe. And uh, so I noticed that he was reading. I said, you know, I said, uh, are you are you new? I said, I said, you're going to the conference. He said, yes, I am. I said, uh, I said, hi, I'm, I'm Lane Sebring, family medicine, uh, in Wimberley, Texas. And he said, hi, I'm Walter Willett from Harvard. And, uh, and, and, so, and I said, well, is, have you been to this conference before? No, I haven't. I said, well, I, sorry, but I couldn't help noticing what you were eating, and I, and, uh, and I wanted to warn you, this is a very paleo-oriented conference here, so uh, beware of that. And he said, what is what is paleo diet? So I began to tell him what the paleo diet was. He began to argue with me, and I, I came back with a few responses, and then we got up and left and went on in, and he was the first speaker, <laughs> and so which I didn't know he was speaking. And you know, it's, it's kind of funny. What what comes around goes around, and yeah. uh, in March, in or later in March, the second or third week in March, I go down to a great big conference put on by uh, oh Andrew Weil in mm-hmm. University of Arizona, and so guess who is. I'm pitted against at this uh, point counterpoint paleo. You got it, Walt Willett. <laughs> wow. I've spoken. I've spoken with him and against him, and and I think it's kind of funny is that you know the original Boulderado. I mean, God, that was years ago. This thing is haunting him. It's coming back, and it's like, okay, Walt. Uh, we now have 19 randomized controlled trials. We have a meta analysis. Can you believe it? Lane, we have a meta analysis in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition on paleo diets. So it's just it's just it won't go away. So it's kind of funny. It's 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 very timely that you should bring that up and I'm gonna be speaking um about the concept and I'm contrasting it to the Mediterranean diet, which I think is a healthy diet, but there's a healthier one still. Right. And uh and vegan vegetarian diets, and so, well, he's he's a good guy. I, I I've known him for years, and uh, he, he's kind of soft spoken, and uh, you know he's just got a huge reputation. He's published more papers than I'll probably ever read in my lifetime. But uh, you know he's just a a good guy, and and I think intelligent people when they finally get it, it's like all right, there's something here. What's his argument? What is his Walt. argument? Walt, yeah, what is he talking about? Well, he, I, he was involved with the food pyramid, if I remember right, oh. early on. So he's, he, it's kind of the old style. Okay. On this, on this uh, the, the point of my story really is, is even better because um, he was the first lecturer. He came out, and then you came out next and totally, I don't know what to say, except but it eliminated his his entire presentation for <laughs> consideration. And I don't, I don't re- recall that, but there's well, been so many it talks. Just ha- yeah, I know. Uh, uh, it just happened. But, you know, the next couple, the next people that came out was Mike and Mary Eads. And oh. they wrote uh, Protein Power. And, and Mike Eads said, when he first walked out, the first words out of his mouth, and I'll never forget, he said, well, after seeing that, what we'd first like to say is the paleo diet is the book we would have written if we had known more. <laughs> well, that's a great compliment. Mike is a good friend of mine, and uh, uh, you know, it's uh, as the years go by, it's amazing to think that you influence as, as many people as you have. And uh, I just, uh, I am totally humbled by the, the entire uh, way in which this has been received and how it is becoming. You know, I mean, can you imagine? It's like this is a mainstream nutrition conference down in Denver uh, being put on by the University of Arizona. And uh, so so anyway, that's uh, well, that's kind of funny. But uh, 
I think so, Lane, let me ask you, how, what, what have been some of your, uh, um, you know, experiences with the, the paleo diet and some of the, you know, the things that have improved people's health and, and what have you? Well, I, I think the, uh, the biggest learning experience for me is how to get people to do the diet and then, yeah. to, and then to just sit back and experience it themselves, how things change. You know, I've had patients now following this diet for over 15 years, but they never took out dairy. And then one day, you know, two years ago maybe, they decided to take out dairy and says, oh, my gosh, I wish I'd have done this. You've been telling me all this time. And I just thought, no, no, I'm not going to do that. And they do it, and then they have this the next level comes to them in terms of their health. That went away. This went away. My mind is clear, whatever, you know. But you see these people that never did do paleo uh, quite as strictly. And it doesn't have to be like you said in the beginning. You don't have to do this diet 100%. But except you said those with chronic diseases need to do it 100%. And so that's kind of the way I've sort of pushed it. But it's really fascinating to see uh, the just the the layers of problems start to melt away and these people are their their con- self confidence goes up their ability to manage their own health to recognize when there's problems and and they begin to proselytize this diet themselves and and uh, i i see um it's i i've actually got into a lot of cancer treatment now um as a you know kind of under the radar i hope but it's it's uh, it's been um, that's always the foundation because you know it's a low glycemic index and the cancer cells love the glucose and and it it tends to you can make people a little more alkaline with it if you want more readily because I think all the foods we've added in the last ten thousand years are tend to be too acidic and it's it's more difficult uh, to get that way if you don't pull those those out of the diet become more alkaline so I I've just seen it used in in, in everything I do because. I think, you know, the, the the reverse engineering of paleo is if, you know, the reason we have these chronic diseases is because we don't eat that way, we don't live that way. And once you understand that, and once I get in, that into my patients' heads, then they're they're completely armed. And it's really nice to see these more whole people uh, correcting and, and directing their own mistakes in their own lives and, uh, and, and getting better. I, I've seen... You know, I've seen, uh, I've got a, a great chart of one patient that uh, t- took his blood sugars. He had a blood sugar of 404, didn't know he was diabetic, and a hemoglobin A1C of 12.4. I called him up with the results, and I said, are you, are you, uh, he, he, I said, you've got diabetes. Are you sure? And I said, yeah, times two. And uh, he said, well, I don't want to treat this with, uh, with um I, I don't want to treat. I don't want to take drugs and 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 shots. He said, "Can I treat this with diet and exercise?" I said, "You know, I, I, I think you can." You know, I said, "You've got the Paleo Diet book. You never read it. You need to read it and follow it. Call me with any questions. Get an exercise program. Something you can do pretty much every day. Something you'll enjoy doing." So he, he got a bicycle and he marked off one mile exactly because this guy's an accountant. And so, but he he really did this diet. He'd been sleeping in the chair for. Um, about 18 months, I think he said, but a year and a half. And the next day, his heartburn was gone. That's why he's sleeping in the chair. And so, uh, by the by, the fifth day, his energy had gone up. He said, "I feel like I'm 20 years younger." Uh, his blood pressure by day 21 had normalized, and his sugars were perfect. He's no longer diabetic anymore, and he's he's not since. And so he began to look at food differently. As uh, he said, you know, it, my reward used to be food. Now it's my happy mind and body, and my increased productivity. And so you you see people changing their uh, their um, their value system in a sense um, by going on this diet. You know, I think I have something I call insufficient reward syndrome. I probably should write a short paper on it. But people need a certain amount of reward and input, and if they are not getting that, then um, they're going to do something to try and fill that in. Everybody's working too hard these days, too many hours, and they're coming home and and then. You know, they said, I need a break from this. So they'll, they'll pour, you know, a glass of wine, and, and then they can't lose the weight they want to lose because they're drinking two or three glasses of wine thinking they've earned that and they need it. And, but once you can get them into the paleo, they handle the stress better. There's more reward to be had from, from the things they do. They feel better during the day. Uh, and there's not, such a, there's not such an insufficient reward, you know, for the amount of effort they're putting out. So I see that. Uh, in in my patients that they began to change their values that way and uh, 
it's it's really all life altering. I I wrote an article called um, Paleo Diet Healthier Children and Orgasmic Birth, and I had these women coming to me and saying, you know. Dr. Sebring, I had an orgasm pushing that baby out, you know, kind of whispering it. And I didn't know what to do with that. I mean, this is this is really interesting, um, but I don't know what to do. I've been a fan of paleo for several years by then, but I didn't know about this. And, and they're having orgasms with uh, with contractions. And uh, so I, but I finally got some help from someone at a nutrition uh, group that we visited, and I asked, started asking questions. So there was a book written on that called Orgasmic Birth, so I Googled that, found it. And then I've heard, too, that the, the hunter-gatherer women can do that. And, and so the, you find out that oxytocin, which is produced by the pituitary, you know, goes out and, and, and uh, causes the uterus to contract. But it also, if you do it uh, sublingually or as a nasal spray, the compounding pharmacists were all excited about this a few years ago when they had the availability of oxytocin that it increases the intensity of, of orgasm and duration. And so I thought, that you know, that's not a... That dual activity of oxytocin causing that in the uterus to contract is not an accident because all those endorphins then are going to be blocking down pain for these women. And, you know, what if we all thought we were born through some sort of orgasmic experience, you know, instead of our mother <laughs> saying something like that's, that? That is. That's, that's fascinating. <laughs> yeah, isn't it? So yeah, I, it I, really I, is. I, I think that uh, your point about uh, that people, you, people have to give it time. It's... You can't give it one or two days. You got to, like you said, the guy that was sleeping in a chair. If I think people start to feel better after a couple of days on this, and after a week, if they pay attention, listen to their body, uh, and they don't go back to the old things, uh, if you can get them onto that, that's that's so important. It really is, and they begin to listen to their bodies because you actually become more sensitive to eating bad once you've been on paleo for a while. I said the bad, the downside of this, and the good side is it's very self-perpetuating staying on the diet. Because if you go out and have a you know big pizza or something after you've been off grains for six months, you're not going to feel good. No, you'll feel <laughs> awful. <laughs> right, so it kind of spanks you, and I, you know that's your body. You know there was there was a patient that I had was was. Uh, 330 pounds and and, uh, uh, and little or no physical activity in his life and uh, early diabetic just barely diabetic but his triglycerides were 779 and his oh HDLs was uh, 23 and so um, he goes on this diet nine months later you know of course he felt better within a week and that was key to me you know he said wow I feel like I'm, I'm 20 years younger basically is what he's saying type thing and you hear that a lot but he but nine months later, he had lost 90 pounds. He's 240 pounds, and he's still obese uh, from a giant belly to a big belly. And uh, But his triglycerides went from 779 down to 74. Oh. So his HDLs went from, from 23 or 21, I guess it was, up to 36. And so the ratio between those two, you know, tells you your insulin sensitivity, right? I don't know if I learned that from you or not. Maybe I did. <laughs> but but uh, at any rate, um, his his ratio went from 35 down to 2, and I like it 2 or below. Good paleo people usually be less than 1 with the triglycerides actually lower than their HDLs. A lot of times you see that. Which this guy had Olympic athlete labs now, and his hemoglobin A1C went down to a 5.0, and I often use that as a, that's an Olympic athlete that doesn't eat a lot of carbs. And yeah. So, and so, you know, how did he get this when he's still obese, zero exercise, and I was such a fan of the diet at that point, I started adding in exercise more probably about five or six laters after this guy had done this. But I thought to myself, you know, those fat cells – the brown fat that's around our internal organs, they produce these molecules, you know, that, that cause mischief, you know. The resistant, uh, resistant and what, interleukin-6 uh, uh, and all, all that, not 6, but it's interleukin-2. L2. Tuber necrosis factor, you know, all these types of yeah. things are secreted by those cells that cause a lot of trouble. And that guy still had those fat cells there. You know he did because he's still obese. But he had no, he obviously had no resistance of any consequence being produced anymore because he had magnificent insulin sensitivity. So it came to me, it wasn't the presence of those cells that was the problem. It was the presence of those cells plus an insulting diet. 
And as soon as you stopped insulting those cells with those with the, the toxins that we get when we eat the grains and the beans and the potatoes and, and probably dairy too, then then they stop producing all those those molecules that make us sick. It's like it's trying to tell you, no, don't eat that. Yeah. I no, I, I I'm not a clinician and it's just wonderful to hear uh uh, these success stories that uh, you you encounter on a regular basis, I had to laugh. I was watching the uh, the Republican uh, debate the other day, and uh, of course, you know that uh, Jeb Bush is uh, doing the paleo diet. Is that right? I hadn't heard that. That's great. Yeah, oh no, he has, and uh, he apparently goes to these Iowa county fairs, and he'll eat a I don't know, a, you know, a hot dog covered in in bacon grease or chocolate or some damn thing that they eat over there. He says, well, I just do that, uh, you know, for once. But he, he, you should see the before and after pictures of him. Uh, and he, he looks a lot, hell of a lot better. He, he's leaned out, and uh, he doesn't have a large gut like he used to. But unfortunately, he didn't do much for his political ratings, <laughs> did no. it? Well, I'm thinking he might make it actually a better president than I thought initially if he's going to stay on this diet. I, I, I <laughs> so anyway, I I thought you'd get a kick out of that because, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I have another I, one other question I really wanted to ask you, and I I don't this is and this is a very selfish question on my part, but I'm I'm uh, I, I did a lecture not long ago um, on on. Basically, that um, the, this paleo concept, this template of this evolutionary template, basically that we've been uh, handed here by you guys getting together on those blogs and putting it together, and I really appreciate you know you putting it all together so that and making it you know popularizing it, making it uh, giving it us access to that uh, to, as a reference. Uh, is is just so important to keep this thing from fractionating into all kinds of nonsense. I really appreciate that, and 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 I and as you know, I try to steer people back, you know, corral them back in. You know, you can you you can uh, uh, create your own diet, whatever you want, put your own name on it. I don't care, but don't call it paleo, you know. And so, yeah. uh, but that that concept and and the of using that tip plate, I'm, I'm starting to recognize um, its usefulness even beyond paleo. You know, if you, if you think about life on this planet or, or this planet itself developing this uh, survival of the fittest, the genetic variation, all these animals as experiments that need the capacity to be free to direct their own lives and their own choices so that these dynamics can work and then choose what works is also a, a template that applies to so many other things and it, and it gives us a heads up when we're making a mistake because if, if that's what the <clears throat> excuse me if that's what this earth developed as the dynamics then that's all it could have developed because it's following its own nature everything is following its own nature and that's what develops so that's the normal uh evolution if you will and if that's true then those dynamics are inherent to this planet at least and so if you look at uh, those dynamics, you apply it to a community, you get, you know, this discipline we call ecology. And if you look at capitalism, it's almost an identical setup. You need the individuals being able to make choices. You need them to uh, have the competition, the, the niches that open up, the, the invention that takes place, the experimentation that takes place there. And, and so... That also would could apply to politics and apply to government. You know, we don't need one central group trying to tell us what to do. The chance of them getting it right is just about zero. You know, we need 300 million people. We need 50 states and 10,000 townships, and the and the freedom to make our own choices, and 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 to see what happens. So you know, you could say, hey, did, didn't Maryland have this trouble? What did they do? You know, we can communicate now. And you can apply that to the Internet. You can apply that to, you can see how that's grown. Each one of those individuals following their own self-interest. Uh, but here's the problem. Capitalism and is, has a problem. And the problem is the same problem evolution has from a human standpoint. It's very violent. It has no concept of justice whatsoever. 
And I think that's a, that's a man-made concept. And now that consciousness has evolved us, if you will, and I thought about this for a couple of years, how can we maintain all the virtues of, this, the, of evolution, what it's brought, all this incredible magnificence, but get a, rid of, eliminate the, the violence and the injustice? And a couple of years later, it finally hit me, and I thought, oh, my gosh, this is so simple. I can't believe I didn't think of it. And the answer is ethics. You know, it's morality. No force, no fraud, long-term thinking. And you, you kind of go, yeah, that's it. Okay, simple. But I think when, if we were to um, almost deify, if you will, not it's a little extreme, but if you would, we would talk about ethics and hold that up as being required for all of these systems to work, so that we get a, a fair, each one gets a fair shake. What we as, as Americans and most most people on the planet believe in, um, then we could recognize when we're making a mistake and when it's not going to work. So if you have these guys in Washington, for example, sorry for keep going back to the the government part, but if they're making decisions for everybody else, the problem is they're also eventually going to start looking out for themselves and not for everybody else. And so that's that's just an evolutionary principle that's guaranteed. And I'm just wondering if you had had run into anybody or what your thoughts were uh, on this idea. Uh, geez, I mean that is that's just a wonderful thought, uh, Lane. I, you know, I, I I'm 65 now, and I've pondered a lot of things in my life, and uh, you know, I, I you have encapsulated a, a very powerful concept, and I. I'm in complete agreement with you is that, uh, you know, the ethical issue here, um, <laughs> how we're getting off on this, because, you know, we're, we're in it for other reasons. We're, we're in it for health and, and fitness and longevity. But your point is well taken is that um, the next step is, is ethics. And uh, you're absolutely right is that uh, in hunter-gatherer societies, they're – was egality, but there was no justice. It, this is how things happened. Mm-hmm. And uh, bringing, you know, uh, egality with justice uh, makes a lot of sense to me. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, there is kind of precedence for that in hunter-gatherer societies. I I, I'm not a, I'm not a real good guy on the behavioral part of it, and there's lots of implications of of paleo in terms of uh, you know the behavioral way it influences people, uh, and you know I, I've thought about some of this, and, and some of it I haven't thought about, but uh, it, it makes a lot of sense to me, and. Uh, well, I hope it makes sense to a lot of people because it, it gives us a way, I think, to kind of find our way through the dark here and recognize where I, I think we're starting to make mistakes and uh, and why we're struggling with certain systems that don't seem to be working. Yeah, it's a um, it's a it's a huge problem, and it's you know we're certainly not going to uh, overcome it overnight, um, like no. the way that the paleo diet has really. Uh, you know, it, it went from kind of an arcane scientific discussion in to a worldwide concept in what uh, t- twenty years maybe, and right. so it's uh, it's just it's an incredibly powerful concept, uh, and it really is is nothing more than applied Darwinian theory. It's it's, I'm amazed that it took so long for us to recognize that um, nutrition is applied biology. And, uh, you know, it, it goes to the same thing uh, that those quotes we talked about. Is, is, right. So I don't know. I, I just don't, can't give you any firm answers on that. But I am so excited to hear that you've stuck with it and you really – I know that you're becoming, you know, you are becoming famous. You're one of the w- most well-known physicians in the world who's applying this. And uh, I see that you, you got on starring role on, uh, you know, a movie and, and so our documentary. And uh, so it's, it's, 
I'm just amazed that it's it's gone this far. Yeah, it's it's really been quite a journey. You know, you just never know where some of these things are going to take you. And I think, that, you know, to me, I couldn't let go of it uh, just because it was there. I couldn't come back and prescribe medicine the way I had been doing. I had to find and learn, and it, and it's been a, an incredible journey for me to learn that I can be more powerful. You know, in the beginning, I thought, okay, well, maybe a little folate would be good for someone with depression, you know. And then, okay, the omega-3s make great sense. And so, you know, but I find people, they, they, they come to me and they'll have, you know, a list of 18 problems. They've been to umpteen doctors and nobody's really listening. And, I, you know, they, they're pouring out their heart with this list of problems. And I said, you know, we're really not going to get to this whole list here today, but I think I have an idea what's going on. I want <laughs> you to do this. <laughs> I want you to follow paleo diet as best you can. I want you to do, I want you to take omega-3 fish oil and I want you to take a good probiotic. And let me see you back in two weeks. We'll draw these targeted labs. And uh, and they come back, and 80 to 85 percent of their own list is marked off. <laughs> and and so you know they did that themselves now, and they'll never forget that. Yeah. And so it they they just had a uh, an awakening much like I did at your first lecture. And so they just said, oh, you know, and, and it's very very empowering. But those other problems have been tricky. That other 15 percent has taken me 20 years, and I'm still working on those. But it's <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, you know, it's. Uh... It's a panacea, but not a panacea for everything. I think that, uh, you know, almost everything, but there are issues that, uh, you know, we just haven't got a, wrapped our head around right now. But uh, I'm amazed at how many... Uh, I, I've had people that called me, and particularly some of the dermatological conditions, they, they're they so, I won't say so rare, but they're rare enough that they have... Uh, you know, weird names like two brothers, the, the something something syndrome, and something something, and it's really really rare. One out of you know five hundred thousand or a million, one point two million get it, and uh, they tried the paleo diet and it worked, and it is a genetic condition, and so everybody in the family has it, and their relatives have it, and whatever, and to a person they all. Uh, improved or uh, completely subsided. So uh, that was a, you know, that was a real life changer for me. It's like I didn't even, know, I didn't know what the disease was. Right. So. Well, you didn't need to know what it was. You just need to know what the, know what the problem was. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's that's what's so fun about this. It changes. You know, medicine puts a name on something and think they've done something. You know. Yeah. And, uh, I've often wondered why doctors just they they never ask why did this happen, you know? And uh, and so uh, how did this come about? They don't ask that. It's kind of like, and I think one of the methods is that, well, you know, you're told a certain percentage of people get it. You know, as a rheumatologist I was talking to one time, and I, you know, she, uh, a lady that had Lyme disease, but she also had uh, another rheumatologic uh, which I, a problem, which I think is a result of the Lyme, actually, in the immune system's response. And so, but I sent her to this fellow, um, whom I'd never seen because she was on, he was about the only one on her insurance list. So, but I got a note back that said she didn't have Lyme disease. Uh, she has dermatomyositis. I said, you know, did you get my note? And he said, yeah, I did. I said, but long story short, I, I ended up asking him, why do you think she has dermatomyositis? And he said, what do you mean? Why does she have it? She's got it because she's got it. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and and I realized that's, I mean, that's an amazing, crazy answer to someone like you who's a research scientist and your whole whole mindset is to think yeah why. yeah exactly and and that's really uh, you know that's what drives a lot of these questions you know I spoke earlier of how does this stuff work and what drives it is the why and yeah to me that's what led me down all of these paths looking at uh, you know, this model of how our hunter-gatherer ancestors did things, and did they have it, and was it fatal? So if you got, if you develop myopia, you had no chance in the world to live very long. So nobody had myopia, or the incidence was so rare, and it was so negligible, less than a half a diopter in all societies. Uh, well, how how could myopia go from being totally you know to the point where 
you, you didn't even recognize it to the point now where, what is it, 90% of some populations develop myopia? How could that be? Hmm. So those are the, the kind of questions that drove... Uh, uh, and ultimately, the answers to those are deal with molecular biology. They deal with the biology of the cell and how hormonal changes through common uh, you know, dietary practices influence hormones, which influences cells, da-da-da-da-da-da, and you get right down to it, and you get pretty close to the answer by taking that approach. Sometimes the answer isn't known. So uh, it was only in the, the early 2000s that we recognized the, the signal transduction system that uh, why high glycemic load carbohydrates, how did they affect retinoic acid? Well, retinoic acid is the signal that regulates the growth of sclera. So uh, those pathways, a lot of them have only just been recently uncovered and primarily only in animal models. Anyway, uh, I, I've been on the horn here for about uh, <laughs> hours. So, yeah. Lane, uh, let's wrap it up with uh, a good – do we have anybody listening that can call in or or is this tape? Yeah, this will, this isn't live recorded, but it will be published afterwards. So if there's any last, you know, take-home points either of you want to make – uh, to leave with the listeners. I think you about covered it. But, I think, yeah, I think yeah. so. But, uh, you know, it's just, it, it, this, this has been the, you know, to me, I, I don't know where this would fit in, but, um, it, for me, it's be really hard pressed to find uh, a more important idea, uh, in the last century to compare to this mm -hmm. for what we could, for it's it, the gift it is, you know. Um, there was one one uh, professor who was writing a, an a lecture who was doing some things about uh, the paleo diet that it was was really questioning it, uh, questioning it. And uh, uh, I wrote back and, and critiqued his paper. And at the end of it, I said, "Don't steal this gift," <laughs> you know, because that's exactly what it is. This is this is an incredible gift that we've been handed. Uh, from our hunter-gatherer brethren through people like Dr. Cordain uh, down to us now that we can look at that and for us to squander that or to uh, dismiss it is would be the, a huge, huge tragedy for humanity. Health should not be our biggest problem. You know, a huge part of our, our, our debt and our budget and everything else goes to health and yeah. you could eliminate the vast majority of that by just waking up and uh, doing the moral thing and quit arguing against this diet. Yeah, yeah that's, I think, you know, a point well taken, Lane. And, you know, you and I, we uh, get to see each other occasionally at conferences, and I, I see your face on these documentaries, and uh, I love it. And uh, I guess kind of the comment I, I, I would like to leave the, the readers with is the same thing. It, it is a gift, and I didn't create it. So don't get me wrong. It's like I, I was one of the guys that was involved in this thing at the middle of it, but it, it will be with humanity long after I am gone on this planet. And so sometimes as I'm in the twilight of my career, I feel like it was a, a gift given to me. And uh, I agree with Lane. Yeah. I've, I've made some contributions. I've, made the world somewhat more aware of it. Don't forget that Boyd Eaton got everybody started on this. And yeah. so, Man. yeah, so let's, but let's recognize, <laughs> yeah, let's recognize all the other pioneers sure. and those people uh, that got us all started. It, it, it's, it's not a fad. It won't go away. Yeah. Well, it's a gift, Dr. Cordain, that you join us and, and Dr. Sebring, and that, that I could be and everyone could be a fly in the wall of this amazing conversation. So thank you so much. I think people should go to the paleodiet.com, Dr. Cordain's site. There's a million resources. You could study this stuff for you know a decade and probably not get to all of it because uh, I've tried. And uh, check out the Paleo Diet book 
and also um, SebringClinic.com. So thank you both so much. It's been really valuable. Thank you. You know, many immunologists now kind of are buying into uh, the idea that <clears throat> we first promoted way back in 2002 that a leaky gut mm. was one of the characteristics <clears throat> excuse me that underlies uh, you know many autoimmune diseases and now Lethio Fasano and uh, others at the University of Maryland Celiac Center are saying the exact same thing really is that, yeah is that uh, a leaky gut it tends to be one of the um, I guess what do you want to say symptoms of of bigger problems yeah of of immune problems so that's interesting and uh yeah let's talk about that a little bit you know i'll do the introduction in a second but i'll just you know have you talk a little bit about that right now as we're talking on the on the topic because i do have questions about the i think that is an interesting topic especially with a lot of the you know the crohn's ulcerative colitis and the leaky gut what um, should people be thinking about doing uh, for the leaky gut? And what have you found in the research? Uh, well, it, it's basically with a lot of uh, the foods people eat. Mm -hmm. So it, it goes back to the same thing that we were talking about with paleo diets. Mm -hmm. um, is that uh, cereal grains contain a variety of substances that can promote leaky gut and one of the best is gliadin so mm -hmm. that work comes out of Fasano's lab and they actually <coughs> isolated the me mechanism by which it works and it works tends to work in uh, um, both normal and uh, celiac patients and it, it's a hormone called zonulin mm-hmm and so the mechanism of zonulin was pretty much isolated by Fasano's group in, I don't know, 2005 or six, and yeah. has been borne out. So, <clears throat> so that that's interesting, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it, it'll take some time. It's, uh, uh, you know, what, what are required are randomized controlled trials, and uh, clearly with something like an autoimmune disease, mm -hmm. uh, it's not just, uh, um, you know, an environmental insult. It's also a genetic predisposition. There's a lot of factors. So there's what's called the human leukocyte antigen system mm -hmm. with that, HLA. And uh, there's different HLA haplotypes. And so um, those haplotypes... Uh, present a, a genetic susceptibility to uh, virtually all autoimmune diseases have some sort of HLA susceptibility haplotype. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they it's not a 100% matchup. Some of them are 60, 70%. Some of them have multiple haplotypes. Mm -hmm. And so it's the way in which uh, uh, T cells... Um, receive the uh, the antigen from the the what's called antigen presenting cell mm -hmm. I don't know if I how what how much not you know how deep your knowledge is of this but I don't know that getting into that kind of detail yeah uh, it's very technical <laughs> yeah uh, um, but my probably, knowledge is probably m more than most but uh, uh, but not as extensive as that so yeah. anyway, uh, some other things that are, might be of interest to you is yeah. uh, uh, we were the first people way back in 2002 to suggest that uh, acne was diet caused, diet related. Yeah, and uh, that has now been borne out by a couple of randomized controlled trials. Yeah, um, the whole notion that a uh, a paleo type diet has mm -hmm. any benefit whatsoever has now been borne out by 19 trials. Wow. Even been a, 
a meta-analysis published last year in uh, the uh, American Journal of Clinical Nutrition examining, I think, four trials and, yeah. I don't know, 70 to 100 patients. So it's um, it's a concept whose time has come. Yeah. You were ahead of your time, I guess, before, <laughs> and it's catching up. Um, what's the challenge with those trials? What what have you found? How do you run those trials um, with, for the, the acne, for instance? Uh, well, a randomized control trial mm-hmm. is pretty much... There, you know, there's a, a few different ways you can run them. Yeah. But um, you basically have a control group and an experimental group. Right. And <clears throat> one gets the treatment, <laughs> obviously, and then one serves as a control. And in the, the better uh, randomized control trials, you cross them over. So the one group that was the control now becomes the treatment and vice versa. And you typically have what's called a washout period. Mm-hmm. Washout period allows for whatever has happened to go back to the way it was. And then mm-hmm. what needs to be done is you need to uh, <clears throat> do what are called power calculations. And with power calculations, you determine the there's an interaction between the size of the sample and the treatment effect. Mm-hmm. And so the smaller the sample size is, the less the probability that you're going to get a treatment effect. Mm-hmm. So there are equations used that help scientists to calculate the power of the experiment. Yeah. So uh, good randomized control trials uh, take that into account and uh, they determine the effect. And then there's there's all kinds of other things that can complicate it, particularly yeah. if you if you know that multiple uh, environmental or hereditary factors are interacting to produce the effect. Right. And so you need to control for that. So say yeah. for instance, um, you know that acne uh, is related to a high glycemic load diet. Mm-hmm. Well, there's multiple factors that can alter insulin sensitivity Mm -hmm. that need to be controlled for. So, for instance, in the first uh, few trials of quote-unquote paleo diet on acne, they didn't control for uh, dairy products. Ah. The problem with dairy products is that they have a a high, a very low glycemic load, Mm -hmm. meaning that they don't elevate blood glucose much, but they tend to elevate insulin like eating a chocolate chip cookie. Right. So, so if you don't control for the dairy, then you probably are going to end up with a mixed bag, unless, of course, you have a large enough sample size, because the larger the sample size, the more it tends to come out in the wash. Yeah. So, uh, so that was the acne thing. There's also a couple of interesting trials on diet and myopia, we were the first people to say that a diet and myopia uh, were related. And um, at first it was known as the Twinkie hypothesis for myopia. <laughs> really? <laughs> why <laughs> so, why uh, was it known as that? <clears throat> well, because the un- underlying mechanism we felt was uh, similar. It was a, a high glycemic low diet influences hormones that alter uh, axial elongation of the of the eyeball mm-hmm. and uh, that's the the fundamental problem underlying myopia is the eyeball grows too long for the power of the cornea and the lens mm-hmm. so uh, uh, it's very difficult to test in humans because first off uh, adults if you've got myopia, it's already there, so you really can't induce it. Um, and with children, uh, it would be unethical to cause myopia uh, in a group of children and and then not to cause it in another group. So right. what you have to you're, you have to rely on is uh, uh, 
not randomized controlled trials with humans, but you have to rely upon animal data. And uh, animals, it's it's very difficult to make them myopic, but mm -hmm. it can be done. And <clears throat> so in the last, um, oh, maybe since 2009, maybe the last six years or so, uh, in animal models, it's now shown that by making them insulin resistance, you can induce myopia. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.